Hey everyone, my name is Kelsey Peterson and I'm going to read you an excerpt from my story in Witnesses' beautiful spring issue as seen on TV. My story is called The Mall. One. Oh, the mall. For Sam, Vicky, and Heather, the mall breathed life into their weary lungs. These were the lungs of three scarcely acneed young women, filling with the mall's perfumed air, not yet marred by the shared spliffs of languid post-SAT basement parties. Weary, yes. Already their lungs were entirely tuckered out. The odious stink of the girls' locker room, the chlorine pumped freely into the pool, the smell of canned veggies emanating from the silver awnings of the cafeteria, the boys' cologne drifting in the halls like toxic clouds. But oh, the mall. It welcomed them with the smoky notes of Starbucks French roast and free samples of warm vanilla sugar from Bath and Body Works. It greeted them with the mellifluous, robotic tones of a woman's voice sounding forth from the entrance. You are now entering entrance G. You are now entering entrance G. You are now entering entrance G. They would not forget. Like the distant call of the sirens, the mall promised Sam, Vicky, and Heather their deepest desires, love, status, sanctuary. But they hadn't yet been assigned the Odyssey in English class. They hadn't learned what the sirens would do. Two, the piercing episode. It's Saturday, Sam thought. He must be here. She smoothed her, pin her hair, pin straight, flat ironed within an inch of its life, and glanced over her shoulder. You won't believe me, but Sam owned three snakes. This was all thanks to one of the newest storefronts in the mall, Reptile Shack, which paraded groups of mall goers on a mini safari of various reptiles and amphibians living ambivalently beneath orange lights and terrains of plastic boulders. Heather was convinced, rightly so, that Sam was only into snakes after being entranced by Britney Spears hoist hoisting a python over her shoulders at the VMAs. While this was true, it was also a ploy to impress boys, and one boy in particular. This boy, he, is Cody Sebastian Manning. Sam snuck a peek at his ID to find out his middle name. The better to keep your diary in code, of course. CSM, captivated soul of mine, clearly soulmate material, etc. Sam suggested heading toward Dippin' Dots, knowing Hollister was nearby, where CSM shopped, according to his polos. Vicky and Heather knew precisely what she was up to. They had barely sucked the last frothy drop from their Starbucks cups, while Heather debated a piercing at Claire's, and now Dippin' Dots? By the time we get there, we'll be hungry again, Sam insisted. This much was logically possible. The mall wrapped in an off-shooting circle some two miles all around. People bust in from across the North Shore to take a gander at the outlets. Walking groups squeaked by in velour tracksuits. Women weighed down with bags like pack mules pushed double-wide strollers. Okay, cool your jets. Let me think just for a sec. Heather sighed. Heather was a double readist. Oboe, transitioning to bassoon. With the face of a Michelangelic David. Soft, strong-jawed, wary. Heather's Walkman, her fifth limb, shone a gunmetal gray and usually spun cold play. There's a reason for this, her parents' divorce. This was her permission to tune out from the world, which had already betrayed her so profoundly. Sam and Vicky either jousted for Heather's commendation of closest friend or slithered to a far corner to commiserate about her dour drag of a mood. Ugh, Heather. The three were still parked by Claire's, Heather indecisive. She was not planning on anything unseemly, just a stud in the left cartilage. Sam was all for it, but Vicky felt it was too overtly rebe rebellious. Besides, Vicky asked, don't you need your mom here? Ah, but Heather had investigated. This Claire's took written permissions without parental presence, but the piercing pagoda on the east side of the mall was a stickler for both. Still, Vicky said, switching her baby blue patent purse from one shoulder to the other, you never know. Vicky, well, let's say her lungs were the pinkest, and would remain so. She was not without vices. 
Among their trio, Vicky expressed the most desperate desire to pit stop at Starbucks, and for that, also the greatest awareness of class consciousness and the social currency of a Starbucks java jacketed cup in hand. She kept, in her purse, a minuscule brochure on how to properly order drinks at Starbucks. She corrected Heather and Sam when they embarrassed her by ordering a small frappuccino and a tall iced mocha. It should be iced tall. Just do it, Sam pressured, then wove through gobs of mall goers to drop her empty cup in a bin. When Sam returned, Heather had taken a seat on the high chair and a woman wearing a Claire's apron and a velvet choker readied a piercing gun. The Claire's worker asked Heather if she wanted to hold the teddy bear. Heather sneered. Vicky held out her hand for Heather to squeeze. Vicky couldn't bring herself to look. Instead, she ogled the tubs of discount tchotchkes, feathered keychain pens and Lisa Frank journals emblazoned with fluorescent dolphins. They tugged at the girlish part of her, the part that squeed when she beheld the racks of bead kits and boy band posters and turquoise hair extensions. But another part of her felt nonplussed. This part wanted a silver watch, a pair of black stilettos, a mobile phone, and just a car already, please. Her mind was a single track revving to the vision of herself as the next Katie Couric. Sam, following Vicky's lead, took Heather's other hand. Sam watched the procedure closely, Heather's eyes clenched shut, the careful positioning of the gun, the Claire's worker blowing a bubble with her gum, the sound of its pop perfectly timed with the snap of the gun as the stud went in. Sam respected Heather's decision, now respecting almost anything Heather did, out of reverence for her complicated home life, but also felt she could never do such a thing herself. The most Sam had contemplated was an upper lobe piercing, and even that belonged to a future moment in her life when she could eat cereal for dinner and go to concerts by herself. Heather, dismounting the piercing pedestal, did not experience the rush of catharsis for which she had hoped. She nodded passively as the Claire's worker rattled off their suggested cleaning routine and presented her with a bottle of saline solution. The twinge of pain, Heather reasoned, would not satisfy her as much as the look of horror on her parents' faces. Although she would discover in the hours to come that not even their looks, of resignation more than horror, supplied the emotional jolt she sought. This would frighten her. To read the rest, get a copy of Witness's Spring Issue. Thanks for tuning in.